This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here, go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. Are you ready to feel the power? Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. And today, we have an exceptional guest, Mr. Jim Schubert from Southern States Insurance. But you probably know him as the dude all over LinkedIn with the Agents Growth Academy podcast. This guy's walking his dog, recording videos, throwing out podcasts, talking to all my friends. And I decided it was time to reciprocate and have him on the TPP. What's up, Jim? Doing well, my friend. God bless you, brother, for having me on. Appreciate it. Absolutely. We almost didn't. <laughs> I know. I mean, I swear, like, I am smarter than my MacBook. It took me a minute, but we figured it out. I remember. It was so funny, man. I remember back in my grocery days, I had a, a district manager, and we were – this is not – tech. Well, I mean, I guess it kind of technically could be technology, but I worked – you know, you remember the old – like you're probably I don't know how old you are, but you're probably old enough to remember this. The old ice cream containers that were Yeah, okay, then you are. They were the cardboard containers and they had like the fish hook that went into the other piece at the top. Yes. And like you always had it was just like a nightmare. And I remember my district manager saying one time, he goes, David, I ain't got enough hands and feet to get into that ice cream container. And that's what I think about any time I see like fumbling technology, me specifically, I tell people like I don't have enough hands and feet to work a PlayStation Two controller. I can get into any ice cream container at any time. Oh, I can get in, but it's not going back in the freezer. <laughs> no, I'm gonna finish yeah. that shit, and it doesn't exactly. need to go back in the freezer. There you, <laughs> there you go. So listen, as we get cranked up, Jim, why don't you just take a quick second and sort of give everybody the ten thousand foot overview of, of who you are and how you kind of got into the insurance industry and. Um, we'll go from there. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. So, yeah, like like so many other people, I had absolutely no desire to get into the insurance <laughs> industry. I'm a second generation agency owner, and when I was in my, I was literally the night before my graduation from my master's up at Boston College, and I had studied before that. I was a high school English teacher. That's what I had studied to do. So. Uh, it was fun because, you know, I was I had all these visions that the students were going to be standing on their desk chanting, oh, captain, my captain. Um, and, and, and that didn't work. Instead, what I got was a lot of, oh, Mr. Schubert, I didn't do my homework. I was like, oh, my God. OK, <laughs> so <laughs> I pivoted. I thought I was going to work in a university setting. And then I had an opportunity actually to work um, to run the student center at Dartmouth. And while that was pretty cool. I was dating the girl who would become my wife, and both of us were kind of ready to get out of New England. Not so sure that we would want to be in the middle of New Hampshire in the dead of winter in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so I was in my parents' hotel room the night before my graduation from the master's, and dad said, so you excited about this? I said, mm, not not really, but he's like, well, why don't you come work in the agency? And like I lost, so I grew up in, in Atlanta. I lost all my Southern charm in about the span of a second. And I was like, Oh hell no. And I was like, Oh, I kind of backed off. He, he's a pretty uh, big imposing guy. And, uh, he was like, okay, what do you mean? I was like, I just, I saw how hard it was for you. I saw how stressed you were getting, you know, getting the agency started and everything. He's like, son, you watched me build the business. I don't think you're really thinking about what it's like on a day-to-day -day basis. And he went on to kind of explain that this is much more of a people-oriented industry. And I said at the end of it, all right, I'll give it a shot for a year. And if it works out, 
then great. And if not, no hard feelings. So I am, I think now 21, approaching 21 years into this. Started uh, literally a month before September 11th, 2001, which in itself mm. was um, a fascinating time to start. And I have grown up in the, I mean, I literally, when I was in high school, I would go vacuum one of the offices. So to back up a second, he started the agency with uh, nothing. He, he literally quit his job, uh, took me and my mom to Johnny Rockets one day in Sandy That's Springs, Georgia. Johnny Rockets. <laughs> Getting a burger. Uh, probably put a nickel in the jukebox and playing something super cool, 60s, whatever. And dad goes, um, he's me and my mom. He's like, hey, guys, I quit my job. I was like, oh, my God. And the first thing I asked was, do I still get to go to my same school? <laughs> he was like, yeah, yeah. But the backstory on that is that he was working with um, Karoon and Black, which was a large brokerage firm back then. And they got bought by Willis, which most people mm. know now. And he had been taught how to do acquisitions. He was kind of tired of reporting back to London every week uh, after Willis bought him and, and entertaining these guys who would come in and all they wanted to do is go to the strip clubs. Um, <laughs> so he was just like, you know, this is, while it's fun, it's not really what I want to do. And so he decided to start Southern States Insurance by just making acquisitions. And so fast forward back to, you know, more modern day, I spent my years in the agency basically started out in personal lines, learned that, learned commercial marketing, uh, got into commercial production for a few years. And then probably the last, I'd say, eight to 10 years, I've really been focused more on management. And six years ago, I took over the agency for my father. He retired. And so <clears throat> we're probably, I think we have five locations now. We actually used to have one down in Florida, uh, down in Destin. But we sold it because it was getting just a little too hard to kind of manage that from a distance back then. And I bet we... everybody wanted to go visit that agency, though. <laughs> oh, dude, it was awesome. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we almost like created an incentive trip out of it. And they were like, no, that's a little too cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Only time I've ever been to Destin, there was like the most insane red tide happening on the planet. And like you walk outside of the like the, the condo or wherever we were staying. Yeah. And it was like you immediately started like sneezing and like your eyes were all itchy. It was disgusting. So <laughs> yeah, I think that must have been beautiful though. The coast. Yeah. You know I mean? We get it really bad down here too. That's basically yeah. what my week at the beach was like last summer over on treasure Island. Oh, Ooh, last man. summer was bad. Last summer was like historically bad. Yeah. It yeah. was really bad. Yeah. Anyway, get that up in Rhode Island. Uh, we spent our summers up there and it's crazy. I'm like, Oh, I don't want to get, I don't want to be anywhere near that. But, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, so we, few handful of locations. Um, we literally, we got people working from home. Of course the pandemic really kind of, we only had one or two people working from home before that we're, we're 40 to 50 people agency. And, um, you know, we had people like trying to do that. And then the pandemic hit. And of course, a lot of us were working from home. And now that we're back, we've, we never really forced people to come back. Uh, people just sort of kind of left it up to them and i'd say probably 30 percent of our workforce is still working from home um but it's allowed they us all to have a lot cats of amazing i bet things. you every yeah i bet you every single one of them has cats oh yeah yeah absolutely those are cat people the dog people all came back to work uh, <laughs> that's right true. i guess that's why i'm in the office yeah but uh <laughs> so yeah it's um it's been amazing I mean, we literally just hired last week somebody from texas that's our first texas uh person and then we've got three up in North Carolina. And, and we kind of told, you know, people who are helping us look like, look east of the Mississippi, if we can keep it within one or two time zones, we're good to go. I mean, my father had the foresight to, for the first two months of the agency's life, it was called uh, Schubert insurance services. And then he was like, mm, let's think bigger. So he went Southern States insurance. So, there you um, go. so when you say you hire somebody in Texas, you guys are actually writing in Texas. It's not like you're hiring remote workers to write in Georgia. Right. Or, or are yeah. you? Yeah, so that, that person is actually an account manager, but um, we do, we're licensed. <laughs> I, you know what? I just realized this. Ironically, based on the story I told you at the beginning, the only license we don't have is New Hampshire. <laughs> really? Hmm. Yeah. So Interesting. Um, it, it, we, we do write business all over, and we're probably, 
60% on the commercial side and, and 40 on the personal. Little life and health, not much. But um, it's kind of the lay of the land. So talk a little bit about Agents Growth Academy, man. Like, that came out of nowhere. I think that I you – know, it's always funny because when I launched Killing Commercial and started marketing for it, I always would hear from people, where'd this guy come from? He, you know, nobody, he, nobody's ever heard of him before. What, wh where's he been? You know, does he, I'm like, yeah, I've been doing this for the last 15 years. That's what I've been doing. Writing business. <laughs> I finally came up for air for a little bit, you know? Yeah. And, um, I feel like you have a little bit of that vibe to you, right? Cause it's just like, you do a great job of consistently marketing every single day and just sharing content. And I, I'm, I'm sure I've not heard it. Like I've not heard it from anybody, but I'm sure they're thinking like, "Hey, who's this Schubert guy? Where'd he come from? Why'd he why'd he just start a podcast and start putting all this stuff out? And why does he send everybody soup? <laughs> soup? Yeah, that's his guest okay. uh, guest gift for being on his podcast. I know. You, I need, you, you flat I need out to, deny I need to understand me. that like, a little bit. Man, you know what, you don't man? Need I'm, it. I'm kind of weird. I know. I'm bad about that. I <laughs> I get my joy in life out of giving to other people, and I get really weird about taking things from people. Like, and I know that things you know come with the the right intent and heart behind them. I'm just I don't know why I'm weird about it. Like, so Ooh. don't you're not isolated. Like, I if anybody if you would have just sent it to me. It had been a blasted all over social. I would have told everybody yeah. how great it was and all of that. But if you give me a choice, I'm going to tell people, keep your money in your pocket. You don't need to do yeah. anything for me. Well, you're, you're a good man with a good heart. Uh, and I learned that actually on a recent retreat from one of our other podcast hosts, Tommy Breedlove, um, I, had, I was kind of in the same mindset of like, you know, I don't want to ever seem like I'm, you know, taking. I want to be able to give. Uh, I admire that greatly about you, David. Um, one of the things that Tommy was said was, you know, the only thing I'll say about that, Jim, is that when you do that, you don't allow the other person to receive the exactly. grace back from accepting it. And I was like, Ooh, man, that's deep. Yeah, it, it is deep. <laughs> and it, it, it has haunted me ever since I declined your soup. Trust me. <laughs> I need to, I need to understand the, uh, the story behind the soup before we go any further. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So the, the story behind because there's got to be a story behind it. You don't just random like there's a reason why it's soup is the thing. Right? I think it would be so much better if it was totally random. You just decided to start giving people soup. <laughs> <laughs> don't even ask him like what flavor. <laughs> just, send, just send him a send him a nice <laughs> bisque. England, just send him a big a big thing of clam chowder. <laughs> <laughs> well, behind it, every great man is a, a wonderful woman, right? And my wife had the foresight of um, we had some people. I think it was like maybe three years ago, some friends of ours had lost a, a parent or something like that. And um, instead of sending flowers, she went online and realized uh, there was this soup company called Spoonful of Comfort. And the story for them is that the founder um, loved making soup and her mother taught her how to make soup and her mother was dying of cancer. And she was just about to send her mom some soup that she had like finished the recipe on and her mother died. And she said, you know, I, I never got the chance to have my mom taste this and I want the world to have it. And it's, uh, you know, I thought the name's great spoonful of comfort, right? Instead of sending flowers, let's do something different. I mean, everybody, you know, we're all humans. We all consume food. We love it. And we decided to give it as a, as a gift. So we normally have a, an employee appreciation get together where we have our employees and their families come together and we'll give out awards and, and have a speaker and just kind of have a, a rah, rah, good time. And last year during the pandemic, we didn't get together. So my wife said, why don't we just send everybody soup? And I was like, uh, okay. So we did. And, uh, man, she's so smart. I got more compliments out of that stupid soup than I got for any of the other gifts that we ever gave, you know, handed out swag yeah. and all this stuff at these meetings. I was just like, damn, that's where it's at, man. You get to people's stomachs and you got them. You hooked them. So true. that's why that's we nice. soup. Like it. Yeah. But, um, but Agents Growth Academy, yeah, thanks, thanks for asking. Um, where the hell did I come from? Kind of like you, man. I came up, from air, uh, came up for air, David. I got um, like – you know, trying to wrap my arms around uh, an organization with, you know, at the time, I think it was like 40 people were approaching 50 now. Um, it was, 
it was a challenge uh, taking it over from my father. And I love my father. Dad, I love you. But you know that you hold things very close to your vest. And so it took me some time to kind of unravel all the little secrets and stuff. And I had to have like multiple, multiple, multiple breakfast with him to figure everything out. I'm an only child, so I don't, I didn't really have anybody to lean on. I've got some good people on my leadership team and I've leaned really heavily on them and, and helped build that out. And we, we can talk more about kind of the, the structure and why that's important in a minute. But I basically spent the last six years just getting the agency to a place where I felt like it was mine and it was being run with the culture that I envisioned and with the, the people that I wanted around me. And then I stepped back and said, you know what? There's people like David Carruthers. And for me, before I even met you this year, it was people like Chris Paradiso and Ryan Hanley and Jason Cass and all these guys that from the beginning, like a few years ago, I had a different podcast where I was, uh, it was more, you know, client facing. I was trying to bring cl commercial clients in. It was called uh, big time, small business. And after 17 episodes, I just let it go because it took way too much time to do on my own. And, but through that process, I was able to meet some people because like you said, you know, you kind of pop up, people pay attention to you. And like one day, Chris, uh, God bless you, Chris, man, you're such an awesome guy. He just randomly, I, I remember I was at a, um, an educational thing up in North Carolina for agency owners. And Chris called me out of the blue and he's like, dude, Hey, do you have, um, do, do you have a finance company, like a premium finance company? I was like, sorry, who's this? <laughs> he's like, it's Chris Paradiso. I was like, oh, hey, Chris. Yeah, I think you and I have kind of like chatted a little bit. He's like, do you have a finance company? I was like, I, I mean, we use one. He's like, no, 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 dude, do you have one that you own? I was like, no. And so he just went on to talk to me. He's like, dude, I just I hooked up with this company and like I got my own finance company. I've had company that now. exact awesome. same conversation, the exact same conversation with him. Yeah. So, so I was just like, Holy crap. And, and then that kind of stuff kept happening. I was like, you know what? It is time to give back to the industry that have given so much to me. And um, I, I just, part of it for me, honestly, was that as I started out as a teacher, I've always loved doing that and I missed it. I was able to do some of that, you know, leadership and, and training of my own staff. But I really wanted to thank people that were out there in our industry. And I also, you know, it, through the process, man, I mean, we, we've been live for five months, uh, on the show, just over five months. And, um, I couldn't, I did not want to make the same mistake the first time. So I outsourced, um, everything, all the production of the show to a company called podcast multipliers, um, out of Idaho, great guy named Josh tap. Um, he's got a phenomenal podcast himself. And, um, they do everything. And so when you see me posting that frequently, it's them. Um, but we've talked about everything and they know what I want posted and what I want it to look like, what I want it to say. And, um, yeah, I mean, they've helped market it. I mean, we, we just a couple of weeks ago hit 20,000 downloads in like five months and we're closing in on 25,000. I haven't even had a chance to like make a post about it yet. I've been so I almost said busy, but I hate that word. Uh, I've been so productive. Um, there you so, go. Yeah. So you kind of <laughs> led you led into um, a question that I was going to ask along the lines of the teaching and how that's transferred over to what you're doing now. Um, and, and you know some of the things that you're able to take from that experience. I think it's a huge advantage as a producer if you have a teacher's Whoa. mindset. It's a heck of yeah, a lot for, easier to right. close business. It's twofold. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah it is, and and. You know, for our, because I, so, um, you know, deep, dark secret here. I haven't written a look of business in like eight years because I was so busy wrapping my arms around this larger organization. And I knew that I couldn't do it all, but you're right. The best producers that we have in our organization, the best producers I've seen out in our industry are the educators. You know, I mean, like look at Ryan Hanley and every, like the, the video empire he created on educating people, right. Providing value first. I mean, look at what you're doing, right? This is, this is, people who figured that out have have are winning the day. Do you know Chris Green? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, I just I mean, reset. We have a standing. You have a standing call with him every Wednesday for thirty minutes. Okay, 
I can't wait to meet that dude because um, he you made a comment on a post <laughs> I made um, a week or two ago when I was out on a retreat. I felt bad. It took me like two weeks to get back to him. But um, I, I, I made a post about like content creation and how that was something that agents needed to focus on in order to add value, in order to you know provide something first before you ask for anything in return. And he was like, dude, that's how we created like something like 5,000 pieces of content on flood insurance in the last few years. I was like, good God, like <laughs> that's taking it to another level. <laughs> yeah, they're honestly, man, like they just need to retire his jersey and move on. It's, it's just <laughs> Chris, Chris Green is a whole different animal. In, in true story, it's, it's kind of funny. I, we, I didn't know this until like a couple years ago, but. Chris and I both lived in Birmingham at the same time. We both worked at Winn Dixie at the same time, at like five minutes away from each other, and never knew each other. Oh, that's funny. That seems impossible. <laughs> it is, but we were probably at a little different level of the organization during that time period. So, Winn Dixie um, family is Winn Dixie family. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole different a world, man. What's that? Eat a Jack in the Box? Yeah. No, I haven't. I've never. I I, I lived in Birmingham for three years when I was a kid. I think oh, you're talking about Jax. Oh, is you're that? About no, Jax. there was one. Yeah. You know what? I think they I think they closed it down because there was a lot of food poisoning when I was I was, there was, I was like so, so ja yeah. six years old. I don't know. But I know Jack in the Box is still out on the West Coast, but they oh, did. Okay. They were like they had a horrible food poisoning thing back probably like in the mid 80s, early yeah. 90s or something like that. Yeah. There's still Jack's restaurants in Birmingham now. Okay. And the okay. reason I know that is because that was my that was my staple. I would go get a fried bologna biscuit almost every <laughs> single morning. Fried bologna biscuit? Fantastic. Listen, I was at Sea Island Club in St. Simon's Island. Pretty low Island. cholesterol. And you didn't want me yeah. to send you soup? <laughs> <laughs> I was this is a true story. It actually just showed up in my Facebook memories. Um I've got buddies that own a few buddies that own agencies up there around Brunswick. And uh the one guy took us took me to lunch over at Sea Island Club on St. Simons, and I went in there, got into the clubhouse to eat lunch, and I look, and just awesome menu, and then like right staring me in the face in the middle was bologna sandwich, and I'm like, done, got to come and have the fried bologna sandwich, and it was absolutely <laughs> epic. I'm sitting here looking at all this Davis Love the Third memorabilia, chomping on bologna in a very nice, just crushing a bologna sandwich, yeah, slathered in mayo. Yes. Yeah, the preferred, the, the preferred lunch of Fred Sanford, probably, you know. <laughs> so good. Fantastic. But anyhow, so, I mean, what do you, I mean, what do you see happening with this thing, man? Because, I mean, I know what it's like. You start with, like, one, you, you start with one thing, and then it spiders into, like, a whole bunch of other stuff. And then all of a sudden, you're just constantly going, and to use your word, being productive, right? I'm not. I'm. I'm never busy. I'm always doing something, and usually that yeah. something is to make forward progress. But yeah. it does take up a lot of time. Yeah, God, man, you're you're so right, and that's actually one thing. Um, thank God I went on that retreat with Tommy because really put things in perspective for me. Of like, you know, have to put myself first because there are so many things, and I'll talk about that in a second. But there are so many, so many damn things going all all at once, and like one thing you told me about David when we when you were on my podcast you talked about like dude when you walk through that door you are the human jungle gym for your children and yep. that to be candid to get vulnerable with you that was one thing i was missing and um especially after this last year and I, i've said this um to folks before um our our two older ones have kind of struggled you know with with like depression and stuff this past year so when i needed to be there for them as, as much as I was, and I was, but not as present as I could have been, not nearly as present as I could have yeah, been. Yeah, there's a difference between being there and being present, you know, yeah. and I think that I, I think everybody struggles with that to some degree. I mean, yeah, you know, I'm not going to so many distractions. Like, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the thing is, I'm not going to sit here like all pious, like I have it all figured out and then I'm right. No, there are plenty of times that I go home after a brutal day at work. You know, look, I'll give you a great example, man. I was in Phoenix for the, at the Better Agency Conference last week, and we just, I decided it would be the great idea to take the red eye home so that I was there with my kids all day until it wasn't a great idea. And Delta <laughs> switched my flight from going from Phoenix to Atlanta to Tampa to going from Phoenix to Minneapolis to Atlanta to Tampa. And oh. I was traveling with my oldest, who I was taking to let him experience the first conference he would, you know, he would go to. And yeah. 
I'm thinking, oh, yeah, he'll be able to grow up and say, remember that time when Dad and I took the red eye back from Phoenix? You know, all the memory making and everything else until I got home and I'm just like, I just want to go do a face plant in the pillow. <laughs> and my kid, that doesn't register with that, man. You know, I've got a 10 year old with special needs and an eight year old and they they don't that doesn't compute. And so, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I wanted nothing to do with it. But, you know, I. I'm one of those people that when I commit to saying, hey, this is the way it's going to be. This is what I'm going to do. I don't deviate from that. Yeah. And so even even as much as I just wanted to go in and do the face plant, when the kids' faces lit up when I walked – I mean, I, it wasn't even when I walked in. Like, literally, I think Caroline saw my front bumper come around, like, the corner, and, like, she sprinted from where she was in the yard to wait for where I parked my truck. And I'm like, <laughs> you know what? I'll just deal with it. You know, it is what it is. I'll get plenty of sleep tonight, but yeah, drink um, one of your disgusting bang energies. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but you know, I think, I think that the first thing is for any of us that we have to be committed. You know, yeah. I think so many times it's easy to commit to your job. So many times and it's easy to commit to your spouse to a certain degree. Sometimes you don't, you know, you don't like each other as much as you love each other, you know, <laughs> but, but you're committed, right? If when you're yeah. married, you're in that relationship. And I think sometimes kids take the back seat, man, because it requires more energy. <laughs> it requires more effort and it requires more intentionality. And, you know, as much as I was in an athlete growing up, the last thing I want to do is throw the football when I get home in the afternoon, but I do it. Yeah. You know what? And I enjoy doing it. Once I get, yeah. once I get into it, then, you know, I'm right where I need to be. But <clears throat> I think so many of us lose so much in life in terms of value with our family because we're chasing dollars. Yes. And that's yeah. just not, that's not how I'm wired, man. I would rather be dirt poor with a great family than have all the money in the world and be by myself. Absolutely. And too many of us push ourselves that way because we yeah. get addicted. You look, let's, let's just call it what it is, man. The production game specifically in commercials, addictive, man, the, the, the adrenaline rush you get, the, the serotonin that's released in your brain, all the adrenaline and everything that happens when you close a big deal, you live for that and you, you want more of it. You go out and you do it again and again, and then you move into bigger accounts so that you get the same rush and you're, and the next thing you know, you got a kid graduating from high school and it's like, what, where are the memories? <laughs> what do I have to show for this? Yeah. And who cares about how many agent or record letters you got? Who cares how bo big your book of business is? The whole reason I have an agency that I own is so that I have the flexibility to be there, period. Right. Yeah, it's a vehicle f to allow you to do the things that you really want to do, right? And, and yeah, I, you're I'm pretty sure that my team, I'm pretty sure that my team would can tell say unequivocally that my values are 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 very much on display like there's not anybody in my organization that would say they that i would expect them to miss a ball practice or a game right. or a dance recital heck no right. i would tell them i expect them to be there i would mm -hmm. fire somebody for missing a family event over going to the family event and missing work right yeah and that's backwards to a lot of the way a lot of people think yeah i had yeah. someone whose uh, father tragically passed away yesterday morning uh and she mm. only just started working for us like a month ago and mm. she had had to miss um, a little bit of work, more than we would want for a new employee. But it was for legitimate reasons. You know, family, uh, her father had a stroke. And then uh, this last stroke, you know, ultimately killed him. Um, mm. It was literally yesterday morning. And she emailed me. <clears throat> you know, I sent a prayer uh, request out to the company. She emailed me back yesterday afternoon and, and said, you know, thank you so much. Um, yeah, this is what happened. And, and I'm, I'm so, so sorry. I'm so, so sorry that I'm having to miss work. And I was like, um, please, like family absolutely comes first. I mean, this is your darkest hour. Please don't worry about missing work. I, I understand that mm -hmm. you're new and you're concerned, you know, for your job. But like, this is real stuff. This is family. You cannot... Can't you can't qualify that enough? I mean, yeah, it's so. So yeah, for me, it's like I'm so glad that I'm working on myself now. Because when you ask me like what 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 do you have going on? What's going to come out of this? And, and I'm sitting here thinking like there's a lot. But before I even start to try to make that work, um, I am consciously, intentionally working on myself, my routines. Uh, thank you for your book, by the way. It's amazing. Um, that helped tremendously, and it's being reinforced over and over from other people I talk to. 
but getting routines set, getting habits set correctly. And then, um, as you said, <clears throat> you walk that, you walk through the door, you are the family man and putting those two things into place and perspective. Now I'm ready to run. So it's interesting. Um, you're, you're so dead on, man. It's, it's funny when you start doing something like a podcast, first of all, everybody thinks that you're an expert. Mm. That's nice. I mean, I'm not, but thank you. Um, just putting yourself well, that's why out. I started on it. I wanted people to like, think I was an expert at something, you know, I mean, I didn't yes. want to get any street cred, <laughs> so I had to start a podcast. Yeah. It's, uh. it's crazy. I mean, you, you know, you just put yourself out there and, and, um, but it's been fun and, and I have to tell you, so before I get into kind of what I'm thinking about doing, the one thing that I never, ever, ever expected, and I don't know why, because it goes back to why I got into this business in the first place. It was, you know, what my dad said, it's the people part, man. I have made the deepest, most valuable connections in the past five months of doing my podcast and doing stuff like this than I have made probably in the last 10 years. I mean, it's kind of sad in a way that it's taken that long, but it's allowed me an outlet where I can get in front of so many smart, compassionate, empathetic, on fire, like just doing the most amazing things kind of people. And I've had so much damn fun doing this. And it's funny because I've asked people along the way who, you know, like you and, and others, you know, what, you know, I, I, one thing I'd personally love to get into this over the next year is uh, public speaking. I've never done it. I mean, I do it a lot in my own agency, but it's something that I'd love to do. kind of goes back to the teaching aspect. It feels, feels like it would be very natural for me. And, um, I asked, I think it was Brian Falchuk, um, you know, who's big into the uh, insure tech uh, space. Mm -hmm. He was like, I said, yeah, how did, how did you get into that circuit of public speaking? He was like, write a book, man. I was like, what do you mean write a book? He's like, because think about it, dude, the people who are inviting you to conferences want to have authors and people who you know what the heck they're talking about. Right. So, um, so I, I sat down, I thought about what my passions were, uh, my buddy Josh, who runs a podcast, said, um, you know, I got a, a book coach if you want to talk to her and kind of talk through what you think would be a good topic. And um, what I landed on was storytelling, using storytelling in business. So um, I just wrote the intro. Um, I'm going to get on a couple of planes here. We're actually taking our producers to Mexico uh, next week for the uh, producer incentive trip. Oh, sorry. As my CPA said, our travel for training. Sorry, travel for training. Huh. It's not an incentive trip. Well, you got to train them. You got to train them on how to operate yeah. in Mexico. Yeah. yeah. I hope the feds aren't listening. Don't um, eat the worm. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, uh, but it'll give me some time to, to really dig in, start writing it. And um, for me, the reason I want to do that is because some of the best people that I know in our industry in terms of production are people who can tell really good stories. Um, our COO, who's my lifelong best friend, we know each other since we we're three years old, John Hall, that dude can spin some yarns. And I mean, he just draws people in like, you know, uh, light does for a moth. He's just, it's unbelievable. So I look at people like him and I look at others who do such a good job of telling stories, um, to be able to, cause stories, what do they do? They build trust, right? It literally, the, the trust chemical is called oxytocin. And, and it, it, it goes off, you know, in our, in our bodies and our brains when you can put somebody in a position where they're relating to the character in the story, whether that's you or, you know, another insured that you're telling a story about, whoever it is, uh, that when they can see themselves in that character and then see the transformation that that character goes through, they want that transformation. That's what they want. They don't want your product. They don't want, you know, what you're selling. Um, hell, they don't even really care about you. They want the transformation that you or the product provides. And so I want to teach people how to do that um, on a, you know, kind of like a, a packaged method of, of teaching them how to do that and, and kind of learning from some of the best. I'll be the first to say I am actually not the greatest storyteller. Um, and, and this, the book that I'm writing, um, I think it's kind of like a, a guidebook, an aspirational book for me. 
It's actually something that I want to, I know right now, I'm going to be vulnerable. I know it is absolutely lacking from our um, website and our other marketing material. But it's really exciting because it's forcing me to start making those changes and getting those things out there so that by the time the book comes out, I can say, and we've also implemented it ourselves. Um, it's just kind of, you know, that's fun. So that I've got, I'll probably, you know, there'll probably be some kind of um, course that'll go along with that if people want to dig deeper into that. Um, but, but that's kind of, it's kind of what's going on right now. And with the podcast, one of the side effects that I didn't, you know, I mean, I, I kind of had in the back of my mind, but I was like, well, I don't know how effective that's going to be is it's actually attracted people to us from like a recruiting standpoint, which is kind of mm -hmm. nice. And even from an acquisition it's candidate scary. standpoint, which is really nice. And I'm like, oh, huh, okay, well, <laughs> let's use Agents Growth Academy to like, first and foremost, teach people, give them value. And then along the way, if we meet some really great people who want to be part of what we're doing, um, then, you know, let this be a great other vehicle to attract them. So I get three or four emails a week with people questioning whether or not I'm looking for producers that they would be willing to relocate and just come down and work at our agency as producers because of the podcast and stuff. Yeah. And it's crazy. I'm like, you know, it'd be very, very humbling. Yeah. Also very, very scary, <laughs> you know, because, <laughs> you know, when somebody says, hey, I'm willing to move across the country to come work in your agency, I'm thinking, What's can't close on? the deal locally? Like, what kind of producer are you, friend? <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, it does. It opens so many doors. I mean, I think yeah. back to, um, you know, we've had and, and the other thing is, is you do this, the longer you do it, the more stories you get and the more feedback you get from the guests and the other people who are on there and yeah you know i get everything from people thanking us for just being completely transparent on our shop talk episodes like where we'll just say hey here's two or three things you can go out and do right now mm -hmm. and immediately put it in your game and start writing business with it and then there's other stories like you know when josh Gurley was on the first time and you know i had to beg josh josh and i Josh and I are thick as thieves now. I mean, he's he's one of my best <laughs> friends in the industry. Love the guy just like a brother um, and all of that. And, um, you know, he uh, he and I started out just having a conversation, I think, in, in IAOA's Facebook page, going back yeah. and forth and realized that we had the same philosophy in terms of how we went about getting business or whatever. So we took the conversation out of the group and we're going back and forth on instant messenger and we had just launched the podcast maybe like a month, month and a half before <clears throat> he was one yeah. of the early like, guests. I listened to it not too, too long ago. It was a great episode, man. Yeah. And, um, and he, um, and, and it's so funny cause I didn't know anything about this guy. Now I know his wife, I know his kids. We've traveled <laughs> together and That's cool. we were in Vegas back, you know, in February together with our wives and had just a blast. But, um, you know, I had to beg him to come on. He's like, nah, you know, I, I don't know. Let me think about it. And I'm like, well, if you got to think about it, man, maybe it's not the right time. You know, I started putting <laughs> the reverse psychology on him. And the next morning he's like, I thought about it, man. I th let's, let's try it. Let's see what happens. Well, you know, <clears throat> we didn't talk as nearly as regularly as we do now then, but I, he called me or sent me a message like a month, month and a half later. And he's like, look, man, he goes, I got to tell you something. He said, I got to thank you for talking me into coming onto the podcast. And I said, why? Mm -hmm. He goes, because he said it, it's, it's changed things. He said, it's mm -hmm. changed things dramatically. He said, um, there's a, a carrier I won't name that we've been going after for years in our agency. And we kept getting shut down and shut down and shut down. And he said, the, the marketing rep from that carrier, somebody heard that podcast and within 24 hours reached out and basically offered us a contract over the phone and said, wow. you know, I apologize. We weren't taking you guys seriously, whatever else. <laughs> and I said, well, that's that's awesome, man. I said, that should be some good opportunity. He said, no, you don't understand. He said, we needed this carrier for our niche. And he said, because we have them now and in, in the business that we can roll from a carrier that's getting off this class, plus the competitive advantage yeah. we have by being able to give them new business opportunities, he said, it's going to be about a million dollar revenue impact to our agency over the next five years. 
I mean, let that sink in Let's for a go. minute, man. Yeah. You know? I mean, just because we gave this guy a platform. Like, we yeah. did nothing. All we had was the platform. He got on. He was himself. We exposed him and let the, let the world hear who he was. And I would say the world, probably like the county at that point, because we weren't getting nearly the downloads <laughs> we get now. But, um, you know, the right person heard it. And they related to him. And, I mean, that is that's really the coolest thing, period, is – we see that over and over and over again every single week. You know, yeah. somebody's multiple things like handwritten notes in the mail. Like that's what gets me going. You know, yeah. you don't you don't need to send me soup, Jim. But if you send me a <laughs> handwritten note saying, "Hey, look, I had a blast on you know on the podcast. This was a you know I really appreciate you having me on or whatever else or or better yet." When people say, hey, I want to let you know I got a $500,000 account because of this tip that you and Kyle talked about, sure. and I wouldn't have done it if I didn't listen to your podcast. That's what gets me going. That's better than any amount of money that you can get. I can vouch for that. They're all over the office, stuck all over the wall. <laughs> yeah, I well, actually I'm just gonna took our soup spilled on it. Yeah, I actually, there you go. <laughs> I actually took and, and made a wall of gratitude around our whiteboard in our conference room. And every time a handwritten note comes in, I tack it up there. Now, and if I'm having a bad day, I'll just go in and walk in and read a couple of those notes and come back in and sit down and get after it again. That's awesome. There you go. So everybody listening that sent a handwritten note, I still have it. Whether you think I just read them and throw them away or not, I keep every single one of them. I can verify. That's awesome. That's, awesome. That's funny. When we were on the retreat with Tommy, he said the same thing. And he literally, he showed us a picture later uh, of his drawer that was like overflowing with these notes. Um, it's just, you know, gratitude, man. It, that is, I tell you what, that's been something that's been a game changer for me in the last couple of weeks uh, since that retreat. Uh, I know I talk about him like he's a guru, but I'm telling you, this guy is, uh, he's the real deal. Um, and, and he started out, he, he went to the top and then he literally went to the bottom, uh, like found himself face down in a ditch in downtown Atlanta, made some bad decisions. And then made it to the top again and then decided, you know what? I actually think I'm not really happy doing what I'm doing. And now he's like consulting and written the book and all this stuff. Um, but it, it's just gratitude is, is, uh, I think it's something that people don't think about a lot. They think it's like, uh, you know, woo woo. This is not something I want to like, <laughs> you know, this is, we're getting too getting too cheesy and deep and whatever. We put a whiteboard up on, um, our, well, I put a whiteboard up on the door that, that is used most often in our house from our, like our kitchen area into our garage, right? It's the place that our family comes and goes. And I just, one morning I woke up, do my early morning routines. I keep a gratitude journal, write down, you know, five things that I'm grateful for. I write down, uh, you know, some affirmations, you know, like, thank you, Jim, for doing this, being this, thinking this, feeling this, um, and, and I, now I go up to that whiteboard and I just write at the top, you know, two or three things that I'm grateful for, you know, it might be like, uh, you know, the, my comfortable bed or, uh, soup or, you know, like, the <laughs> I was going to say, I'm grateful they brought the tomato bisque back this month. <laughs> Dude, you know what? Speaking of that real quick to sidetrack, I have not gotten a freaking soup email from black diamond and i am like legitimately upset about that we used <laughs> to get these he's... soup we used to get these like menus and these like their soup of the day email literally yeah. every it, day it's a, it's a club we belong it's a golf club we belong to uh, okay <laughs> that, that um i gotta tell it's you nice just not a little please. bit weird yeah <laughs> but we used to for whatever reason and i mean obviously we're probably the youngest members in the entire club because <laughs> by <laughs> at least two lifetimes yeah. <laughs> so, but we would always joke back and forth like we would be critiquing the soup of the day email every single day and it just somehow whittled away and now it's not existing anymore like they're not even offering i think soup. they got a new chef or something i'm I, i'm gonna i'm gonna write a letter you know what maybe they'll put that he's on a their salad wall. guy he's a salad guy he wants i feel to like the, the title soup. of this podcast is gonna have soup in it i don't know why. It's, uh, there's i mean i don't see how there could be any other option <laughs> But yeah, any, cool. anyways. yeah, no, what was cool guys. Uh, I'll just wrap that up with is that, um, I just silently started doing that. And what was cool is watching my family, like pick up the pen that was attached, you know, by a magnet and starting to put stuff under it. I was like, okay, now we're getting somewhere. Like, actually so I, I think when things are, are, are not forced, that's when they're not cheesy. Like when it's actually yeah. genuine, 
Um, yeah. Hey guys, or, we're or when do you don't have, now. or when you're, yeah, or when you're not saying, hey, honey, get a picture of me writing on the gratitude board so I can right. put right. it on social, right? True. Like, yeah. Which yeah. I, yeah, I mean that's a good point, man, because that's like everybody does that. Yeah. These days. Yeah, and I think I think people I think a lot of times people automatically assume like I share a lot of quotes and stuff and memes that are motivational or whatever. Sure. I do it because I actually like subscribe to that thought process, right? Yeah. It's not because I want people to yeah, I'm not trying to be all rah rah this, that or the other and be cheesy about it. It's because I read that and I you know what? That makes a lot of sense. That I'm gonna I'm gonna share that one today. And honestly, who cares? Like if it hits home for, you know, one or two people out of the couple hundred that see it then right there you go yeah and you know what that's so important i actually think that my the joy that i've gotten out of doing what i've been doing the last few months with agents growth academy and and the the bigger benefit from anything that i've seen is the deep connections that i've made with people and i think the one reason why i've been having as much fun and having some success with it is because I've chosen to be vulnerable because I've seen when people are vulnerable um, on social media because, you know, and, and quite candidly, like I'm pretty much only on LinkedIn. I mean, I do some stuff on Facebook. I probably need to do more, but I'm trying to cut out as much noise in my life as I possibly can. Um, I don't even, I, I deleted all the news apps off my phone. I, I deleted any, like I get my news now from just hearing from other people. Because I don't need all that extra noise. I want time to be able to spend with my family and with my colleagues and with the people, you know, find people like you having genuine conversations. And I think when we choose to be vulnerable with people, that's when the really good conversations happen. The best podcast I've had, the best podcast guests and episodes we've recorded together and just people that I've met and we haven't recorded together. The best conversations I've had is when one of us or both of us chooses to get a little, little bit vulnerable because at the end of the day, we're all human and yeah, we're, we're, we're running and gunning and, and trying to grow businesses and grow our books of business. Um, but you guys, this is like, this is real life stuff here. We have a very short time and I'll tell you, one thing that makes me realize that is the work that we do with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Uh, and I'm not here to plug them, but like we are we just started our fundraising uh, with them. There's an agency owner here in Atlanta, Clay Snellings, a dear friend of mine who's probably like 15 years older than me, but he has a daughter you living just with had, Cystic You just fibrosis. had him on your podcast, right? I think yes. I saw you push stuff out on LinkedIn. Okay. Yeah, exactly. See, I and, pay attention, so, Jim. What's that? <laughs> I said, I pay attention. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. I appreciate it. But uh, literally about 10, 10, 11 years ago, he invited me and some other agents uh, into his office. I didn't really know what he was going to talk about. It was like my dad and I showed up, and there were a few other agents and carrier reps. And, and he said, um, gentlemen, I need your help. And we're like, okay. He said, and the clock is ticking. And I was like, oh, my God, we're, we just came to a timeshare presentation. What the hell is this? <laughs> And he was like, you probably don't know this, but my daughter has a disease called cystic fibrosis. Mm. And she's in, she's about 16 now. And the median survival age right now is 30 years old. The clock is ticking. And I was just like, oh my God. And I was thinking about like, we had literally just had our third child. Uh, and all I could think about, I mean, I got a lump in my throat, biting my lip. I was like, you know, got like my body got hot. I was like, Oh my God, I can't even imagine. And so we've poured our passion into our agency rallied around that. And now we've created this thing called insure the cure where we've raised over two and a half million dollars in the last 10 years. And th that, what he said that day, I think about almost every day, the clock is ticking. And so when I talk about being vulnerable 
and being able to make those deep connections. And, and how does this relate to like producers and, and being able to go out there and yeah, because and it translates directly stuff? to how you interface with clients, man. Yes. That's yes, the problem. You don't it. need to go in and be a stuffed shirt when you're dealing nah. with people. You know, nah. we want to go in and, and we want to validate all of the designations that we have and talk about a bunch of different stuff, but you're never relating to people on a human level. And yeah. it, it's just like, and I, I talk about this, I've said it on the podcast a few times, but when my kids were younger and even my younger ones now, they, they really don't understand what I do for a living. And I just yeah. told them, I get, I get paid to make friends. That's all I do. I want to go <laughs> out and create relationships and make friends and that's it. But, you know, to your point, I think part of the problem is people, for as much as, as vulnerability is valued, I think on the internet, cynicism trumps it way too much. And yeah. so yep. you have people out there that really have something good to say, but they're afraid to open their mouth and say anything because they just don't want to deal with the backlash. And I mean, mm -hmm. I can tell you as exposure has gained around killing commercial, the podcast, all of, you know, all of the different things that I have my fingers in, I've just had to come to the realization that over 50% of the people who have any kind of knowledge about me will never know me. And they will pass their judgment without ever knowing who I am, what I'm about. They probably think that I'm on here talking about, you know, my family to get more people to buy in and feel sorry for me and get downloads from it or whatever else. To those people, I give you the double middle finger with all sincerity because <laughs> you don't know me from Adam. Yeah. And it's easy to see somebody on a stage. Yeah, and th that speaking and, and, and sharing things with you and telling stories about their family and, and everything else in an effort to relate and just for whatever the reason, whether it be jealousy or, you know, just general disdain for happiness in their life, they, they have a problem with you. I, like it could be the jacket I'm wearing or the, the yeah. shoes or, you know, maybe I say something jacked up, you know, like I make a mistake when I'm speaking and it doesn't come out the right way or whatever else we need as a society in general to learn how to offer far more grace than what we give every single day. Like, it's just not that big of a deal. You yeah. know what I mean? And yeah. we're dealing with this in real time right now. You know, it, it's my account, man, our, you know, somebody very close to us passed away going on three weeks, three weeks ago yesterday. Or yeah. Uh, so, Tuesday. So, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. It was two, three weeks ago, Tuesday. And wow. we were just <clears> in <throat> sales meeting with her a week before. And now she's gone. You know, yeah, and, and that hits you between that hits you between the eyes. But then you realize, holy cow, you know, she had a daughter in college, a daughter in high school. Her oldest just turned 21 this last weekend. And I mean, my heart absolutely breaks for those girls. Mm, and yeah. you have to ask yourself, you know, what do I have to show for it? You know, I made a comment on somebody else's podcast one time. One of the things that bothers me more than anything else is you never know how, very rarely Obviously, in publicly facing people, you know, celebrities and things like that, it's a different story. But for the average person, you don't know how much of an impact somebody's made on the world until they pass away and you see how many people come to their funeral. That's yeah. a morbid thing to think, but that's the tribute. We give tribute to people for doing good in the world when they're dead and they don't even, you know, they don't even realize it. Now, truthfully, those people don't care because they weren't doing it so that they could be recognized for it. They were doing it because of who they are. And so, you know, it was, it was very interesting to me. Um, you know, I, 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 fortunately at 48, I'm just now getting to that point where funerals will become a thing. Yeah. I just wrapped up wedding circuit about 10 years ago and now we're aging and we're getting to the point where it's going to be, you know, it's going to be going to funerals and then our kids will, uh, will be getting married and all of this other stuff. And, you know, I thought about it and, you know, what, what can we do? What can we do to help other people, but also honor someone who passed away way too early. And so the thing that we decided we were going to do is we're, we created, I'm in the process of doing it. You know, if feds, if you're still listening after Jim talked about his employee retreat, earmuff it, will you? But it, I mean, <laughs> we're trying to figure out the tax ramifications and everything and how to officially set up a, a foundation in, in an annuity, basically, uh, you know, an endowment to where we can take people who don't have the means to go out and get their CS, CISR designation from the National Alliance and then sponsor as many account managers from across the country as we can uh. to go in and do that in Kim's honor. But there's going to be community service components to that. We're not yeah. just going to hand it out because you put an application in. You're going to have to apply for it. You're going to have to show us what you're doing in your community 
community and the difference you're making in the world as much as you can. And yeah. then we're going to reward people for that by by awarding scholarships. And if I give a thousand of them away a year, the National Alliance is going to be really happy. Sure. But so am I. And so are a lot of other people. And I mean, I think that we need to think more along those lines instead of just, you know, the, the, where our mind goes this point at, at this point. Yeah. And I think what you just especially there at the end really hit on that clay talked about on the podcast with me was finding your why, right? That, that account manager and her legacy, it, it sounds like that's your why behind doing that. And that gets people, you know, without, without being pretentious at all, just being passionate about it, people naturally follow and are drawn to that. And, and again, kind of going back to, you know, um, building authenticity and, and um, genuineness through uh, being vulnerable, um, that ha understanding what your why is, uh, it, whether it's you doing that or a producer putting food on the table for their family, what the hell's your why? Like, why are you doing it? Why are you getting up and doing this versus anything else that you could be doing, right? And, and to me, it all goes back to like what dad was saying in, um, in the hotel room that night uh, was, Hey, this is all, it's a, it's a people oriented business. I'm so glad he said that because if I had missed out on this opportunity to be here with you guys, to be, to, to have met all the awesome, wonderful, super stupendous, amazing, fantastic people I've met in, in the last few months and, and really over my whole career, my God, man, there's just, I would have missed out on a whole lot. It's a great industry if you're interested in meeting people, you know, I mean, yep. it, it really is. It's, it's certainly a, a people industry, but it's a, an industry full of good people. Yeah. You know, every everybody, every industry has, you know, has their bad apples. But I think that I don't know, I've not really worked on anything other than than retail prior to this. But I think that, um, you know, the insurance industry is full of some of the most genuine, caring, um, serving people that there are on the face of the earth, man. I mean, Paradiso is a good friend of mine and he is, he is a gold standard of yeah. what you should do and how you should conduct yourself as an agency owner. And it's, I had to chuckle a little bit when you were talking about, he just randomly called you out of the blue because Chris <laughs> is probably of all my friends, one of the most random people that I know, <laughs> like I won't hear from him for a couple of weeks. And then I like on a Wednesday at seven fifty at night, I'll get a, Hey, just checking in on you, bud. You know, <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> but you know, it's going to come, you know, yeah. you're always, you know, he's, and, and I appreciate that about him um, very much, but you mean for every Chris Paradiso, there's like, you know, 10 more that are out there that people don't know about that yeah. are just quietly going about their business. And I mean, we featured a lot of them, Claudia McLean, Patty Laris, James Castell, you know, when uh, Mike Stromzo, when we were talking, talking about giving back and we did a whole series of podcasts on yeah. people who just give. And it was a great uh, run of podcasts that we had, but not just because of the content, but because we were able to become friends with these people and the more the mm -hmm. people like that that you have the ability to surround yourself with you know the better off you're going to be just by the natural effect of being around others who are doing it right yeah absolutely. i agree man absolutely that's why i think a lot of the net like a lot of the you know the the conferences and and stuff like that are so important for agent agents to get out from behind the desk and go out and network and hang out with other agents. I'm not saying you need to be on a conference circuit going somewhere every somewhere different every week, but you got to get out and meet other people, you know, and, and it's good for everybody involved. I mean, you know, if you want to, if you want a business reason for it, I know people in almost every state at this point, And I get anytime somebody comes to Florida, who do you think they're calling when they need, you know, to refer somebody for insurance, sure. it, you know, and, that's not why I do it, but it's a nice little side benefit from it. But it's the same thing if I know somebody moving to their state, who is it that I'm going to call? And so yeah. I think that so many times we focus on our networks being local that with technology and things the way they are today, you can build a national network in many cases easier than a local network. I'll be the first one to tell you my network is 10x what it is nationally than it is in Tampa. 
Yep. My Tampa network is non-existent compared to. I could, I could literally walk to t- go to Texas right now, and everybody would know who I was in the insurance <laughs> world because I'm networked in Texas. I've got a yeah. lot of friends there, and I'm, I'm going to be out there speaking at an event next month and all of that. But you know, you come to Tampa, people are like who, what? <laughs> yeah. Other yeah. than my clients, right? Yeah. That's and so my true. Prospects. Yeah. I, I and I feel like the same thing. Having done this podcast now for a few months. I mean, some of my favorite people now in my life are not in Georgia. Um, you know, it's, are you, out of curiosity, are you going to uh, Cass's thing in a couple of weeks in Kansas City? Yeah. I'll, yeah. Hey, I finally get to meet somebody in person. There you go. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that was my, like what you were saying, get out there. Uh, I'll be candid. I hadn't been out there in a while doing anything like that, and this will be first time in a long time that i'm going so i'm i'm super excited i get to that's a good you know, watch too, out man. man i'm a hugger so i'm gonna give you big bear hugs <laughs> <on too. laughs> no worries man there's a lot of huggers in that room i can tell you so it, it's a good group well listen i look forward to meeting you in person that's probably a good place for us to wrap up man i think yeah. that I think we've had a good message. It, it wasn't necessarily insurance related. Guess what, people? It doesn't always have to be. You know, I think sometimes just being a good human being is worth discussing because it's something that's not often discussed. So, yeah, true. I really appreciate you coming on, man. And um, I'm not going to send you any suit, but I got something for you. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it, my friend. It's yes, been a sir. pleasure. Well, Thank you for, for having me. Yeah, on, thanks man. for coming on, Jim. Really appreciate Absolutely. it, man. And we look forward to dropping this one soon. Yes. You've been listening to the Power Producers Podcast. You can follow Killing Commercial Insurance on Facebook and YouTube. And if you want to take your game to the next level, next level, check out our book, The Extra Two Minutes, and our website, killingcommercial.com. <laughs>